Thanks for being here tonight. Appreciate your decision to be here. Um, I'm going to do a little recap of last week and clarify a few things. And then uh, this is one of those uh, weeks where the, the scripture that I was assigned is very short. So I want to do a little bit of a review. And uh, it's a good springboard, I think, into the, the next part. Because it's kind of a continuation of where I left off anyway. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, points that I want to revisit and then hopefully make some application with the, uh, with the verses we'll get to tonight. So, um, anyone we need to pray for? Anyone that we can lift before God before we begin class tonight? Anybody we need to? Yeah. yeah. My brother Tom. Tom? Okay. Jira. Jira. Yep. Judy Stewart. Judy Stewart. Fred. Is Tom the Traverse City Tom? Traverse City Tom. Uh, and your friend Nicole, or your friend um, Kim. Okay. Okay, let's pray together. Thank you, Father in Heaven, for the opportunity to be here tonight. We, we're grateful for the opportunity to pause midweek and uh, to reset, refocus, to look at the scriptures, we're thankful that they've been preserved for us, that we can uh, we can dive in and we can study and hopefully grow and enrich our lives from it. And our, our prayer is that we'll always have a desire uh, to feast on the word and, and to let it take root in our hearts. We bring before you several names. Pray for my uncle Tom Dance. Pray that you'll be with him. Um, my family knows that he's, he's had some struggles lately and we're, we're praying for him and his strength. Um, those who are, who are caring for him. We're praying for Nicole's friend, Kim, and her struggles with her cancer treatments. Um, we, we continue to pray for Fred Landry uh, and the struggles that he's enduring at the moment. And we're praying for uh, strength for him, encouragement. Uh, we pray for Judy Stewart as well. We pray that you will continue to help her to heal. And uh, Father, we are Thankful that we can we can come before you in prayer, and, and we know that there are others too that, that might escape our, our thoughts at this time, and we, we're praying for them, and that you will use us as a support system, just a word of encouragement, whatever it is that we can do to uh, to lift their spirits. We thank you, Father, for your Son Jesus, and the hope that we have in Him. And we pray this in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Okay, so last week we talked about the parable of the nets. And um, I talked a little bit about how a lot of the parables um, leading up to the ones that we've done in the last week or two, the parable of the lost sheep, the coin, the lost son, I talked briefly about the concept of something being lost and how that isn't good. Um, I told you last week that I lost my flash drive, found it, thought I lost it again, but here it is. So it's all good. You just have to retrace your steps, slow down. So lost is not good, generally speaking, but in a spiritual sense, uh, it's, it's to be in a sinful state. And so if you are lost, uh, it's an urgent matter, for sure. Um, the parables that we've looked at recently, and then specifically last week as well, we were talking about how there, there is a judgment coming. There is a separation that's coming. Um, we certainly know which side of that we want to be on. And so I kind of took that, that idea of lost and found and then righteous and unrighteous and then applied those as we moved into these last couple of parables in Matthew 13. All right, comparisons. Making parables are, are comparisons using usually things that are familiar. Um, a lot of the examples that you see in the scripture of, of the pastoral persuasion, agriculture, um, anything related to shepherding fishing, and so things that are familiar, things that would have been recognizable and easy to understand. I also talked last week about knowing your audience, that it's important to know who you're speaking to and sometimes tailoring a message to suit your audience. Um, and I told you, we had a little fun last week, we talked about the positive audience, and that is you guys, I'm thankful for you, because the positive audience, we're, we're already kind of in the same place, and that's a good thing. Um, this is my favorite type. It gets more challenging from there. We talked about the neutral audience, right, where they're, they need a little bit more information. Um, and, I, and I brought this up when, when Jesus is talking to the, 
various audiences that he has when he's talking to the disciples or maybe he's talking to the, the Pharisees or whoever it might be. Knowing your audience is really key in making sure the message sticks. Um, I love that Toby, if you've ever seen The Office, this is Toby Flenderson, <laughs> if you're not familiar with him. He's, he's a barrel of laughs, as you can tell by the, the image up there. But this is the disinterested audience. That's kind of the one where uh, they're, they're just dull or bored to tears, and they just don't really see the relevance to it, and you have to work a little harder for them, right? And then I like to call this the Bob Knight audience, or the opposed audience, right? The, the hostile crowd. So we had a little fun with that last week. Then I moved into this idea of, of sorting things, right? This is a very simplified, not really in a spiritual sense, but just the idea of sorting through something. And I always complain that, that uh, when you're trying to find lumber for the job, you have to do some sorting. And it takes a while to find the right boards. Right? If you're patient, you can usually find a couple that will work. We talked about the parable of the weeds last week as well. So we were talking about how, um, uh, actually I'll just read it for, uh, for review. Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No. For while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Right, and we broke this down last week, and uh, I referenced Tyler last time. He's like, what do you guys think? And then you read a couple sentences later, and there's the answer. So. Uh, the symbolism here, right? The, the, the one who sowed the good seed, the son of man. The field itself, we said, was the world. It's described that way in the scripture. Uh, the good seed itself, the sons of the kingdom. The weeds, the sons of the evil one. And it makes sense if you think your way through it. Uh, the enemy makes sense, the devil. Right? Causing problems, left and right. The harvest, the end of the age. And then the harvesters, the angels. What these parables make clear, too, is that the angels will be doing the separating. It's not men that will be doing that. So I think my study throughout the last week or two, like you, you come to these conclusions, and that's abundantly clear, I think, in the scripture. So I showed you this picture last week, a little self-deprecating humor. Um, I caught a really small fish that day. And maybe I should have been grateful that I caught anything. I was talking to Perry. I won't put Perry on the spot, but some days are better than others on the water, right? And of course, my friend Tom, my friend Tom's kind of a short guy, so like when I stand next to him, I'm always kind of like, you know, hey Tom, and then he catches the huge fish, and, and then there I am with the little fish. So I thought about this image last week, and I thought, I don't want you guys to think that I'm a terrible fisherman. So like, here's a picture of me with a pretty good size, it's, it's dark, but it's there. It's a pretty good size smallmouth bass. And now if you come up a little closer, you can actually see it on the monitor here. There's a, there's, a, there's a faint outline right here of a very heavy bass that, that I did catch. I'll vouch for it. There is a fish on TV. Yeah, of course, of course it looks terrible up there. Of course it looks. Um, I'll skip, Perry told me not to bring him up this week, so I'll skip, I'll skip Perry. Okay, I'm gonna skip through this too. Yeah. I wanna get to my stuff. Okay. okay, so let's go back to the parable from last week and then that'll take us to the, to the end of, of my section. So the parable of the tares and then the parable of the dragnet, they're similar. Um, you can't really say that they're identical. They aren't, but they're similar in a sense. Um, I think the time periods and the, the, te the verb tense, we're talking about different things, but the concept of the sorting and uh, the judgment, right, is, is there in both. So I'll read this again. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. 
And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. There you go. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. So I wanted to come back to this and try to, try to clarify a few things. So I had a chance to look at this a little, in a little more depth this week, and it does make a lot of sense. And so I want to I share this with you. So hopefully it's not too small. Now you can see it, okay. Um, so the lake, right, we were talking about the, the field, right, being the world. So the lake in this, or the sea in this instance is the world. Um, and then it makes sense that the, the church would be the net, right? And within that net, you have the, the people who are part of the kingdom, right, part of the church. And sometimes that makeup can be a little bit different. Maybe not everybody's in the same place. So the enclosed fish that are within that net then would make sense, would be the members of the church. So right, and, but there's a sorting, there's good fish, there's bad fish. Right? So the idea of, of righteous, those that are truly spiritual, and then those that are sons of the evil one, right, or the wicked. So if you go a step further then, why the two groups in one net? Why the proximity of, of this one net it's got all these fish in it, and they're so close together. What's the concept of that, right? What thoughts come to mind? If the net is the church, and then if I go back to this slide, the enclosed fish are the members of the church. What's the next connecting of the dots? Where do we go from there? Does that make sense? Concept of good and bad within the kingdom. What does that make you think? Well, it reminds me of um, the books that Paul wrote, even as early as the years when Paul was still alive, there were bad fish in the church, and he was writing to the churches to alert them to that fact and alert them to how to handle it and how to take care of it. Yeah, a lot of the letters are, are tackling things of that sort, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, Dave. Uh, Second Timothy, uh, chapter 4, mm -hmm. the first four verses, kind of what Barb's talking about here. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge, the living and the dead, and the minds appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, <coughs> exhort, and bring patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Who's they? Christian. Christian. So, let me put it Yeah. Yeah, and there's, and there's always, uh, I think, it's abundantly clear that we are to be, to have our guard up. We are to be, like, looking out for these things. And the only way that you can be fully equipped is if you're continually studying and knowing what truth is so that you can recognize things that, that aren't. So if they're all gathered together, right? And then if you continue with this, with this analogy or this, uh, this comparison here, so then the beach, if the net is pulled up on the beach, right? It's coming out of the water. That would be, it makes sense that that would be the end. Uh, the filled net then, right? God's will is going to be done. There is a redemptive plan in place. And those, there are those that will be redeemed, right? So then the sorting of the fish, the sorting out of the fish, the sorting of it, the judgment, the sorters, the angels, right, making that separation. Uh, the casting away, logically that makes sense too, wickedness into hell. And then the gathering into the vessels would be the salvation, right? the prize for the godly, and then the vessels as heaven. So if you, if you think your way through that, and you think about the process of, of the net, what the net holds, the net's brought to shore, the sorting takes place, the separation of good here, of bad there, right? It's, I think it's a pretty, uh, it makes sense, right? I had a chance to look at this this week, so I wanted to share that with you. So I'm, I'm thankful that that's not super small. You can actually see that. Pat, yeah, I think one of the points is that he's gathering Christians. <coughs> and there would be a sorting of the kingdom, the right. church. The church. So you're not sorting the world, you're sorting the, he's sorting Correct. the church. Correct, yes. So there are the faithful within the church, and there will be the unfaithful right. within the church. Right. I think that's one of the important points of this parable, is there will be a sorting of those in the kingdom right. here on earth. 
Yes. Um, a comment that I have seen different times is that people who are in the church aren't perfect people. No. They are sinners who are, they're not going to church because they're perfect. They're going to church because they're imperfect right. with hopes of becoming better. Right. Because everyone in this building and every church building is imperfect. Absolutely. Other thoughts? Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so we talked about, um, also I asked the question last week, why, why is Jesus teaching in parables? And he explains that. We read that. But Randy, I think you read the, I forget what verse it is, but we read it right after I asked the question. Yeah. So if you, if you have it, I wouldn't mind if you'd it's read in that. Matthew 13. It's right at the beginning of 13, I think, right? And, yeah, ver yep. verse 10 and 11. It okay. said, uh, yep. The disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has to him more shall be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Yes, thank you. So I want you to look as we get to the end of this now, right? Like moving out of the the parable of the, the dragnet. And he's going to ask the disciples, basically summarizing, does this make sense? And I want you to notice their, their answer to that and then what he says in response to their, to their confirmation of, yes, we get it. So the takeaways from last week, right? And these were just kind of just me logically thinking, like, what can, we, what, what can I be thinking about, right? To, to be reminded of why Jesus died, that there is a judgment coming. Um, we read about it. It is urgent. Um, there will be a separation. Um, we're also told how magnificent heaven, we sing about it a lot too. And there's, there's certain songs um, that I think just give us a very simplistic, we can wrap our brains around that, but we really don't know how awesome it's going to be. And I think that's the encouraging part. Like it's it's going to be more beautiful than we can imagine. All right, so if you'd like to turn to Matthew 13, you can, but I'll have it up on the screen. Um, so when we get to the end of this, he says to them, this is Jesus speaking, he says, have you understood all of these things? They said to him, yes. So he says, and Jesus said to them, therefore every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure Things new and old. So we're going to discuss those last couple of verses now. So it's important for teachers to follow up with students, right? The follow-up is always good. Did you understand? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Um, it's always good for me to check for understanding or a pulse. But anyway, you've got to check for these things and make sure that people know what's happening. Um, what if they had said no? Were they just giving him lip service? Yeah, we understand it. I think the evidence here, though, is that, is that they did, because earlier in the chapter, they did ask for clarification. What does the parable of the terrors mean? So I think here we can reasonably assume that they did understand what he was saying. Does the concept make sense, right? So they confirm it. And as I just mentioned, Matthew 13, 36 is... Uh, a verse that I went back to when I was reading about this to see, like, okay, yeah, they did ask for explication on the parable of the tares. Right. So now after he goes through all of this, we understand. But they, they actually could relate to the parable of the tares because it's a pretty clear and succinct story. And, and many of the audience were farmers, were agricultural, know that this can happen. Mm -hmm. And yes, somebody can come in the middle of the night and sprinkle good seed after you, and you wouldn't know it four weeks and then it's too late. Mm -hmm. And and so then he, yeah. Jesus comes back and explains yeah. to them how we're, we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And how, you, how are you going to get there? Yep. And you've got to go through some things on earth that you're going to understand. You can be aware yeah. and you can pay attention. You can do the right things. But if you just don't pay attention, right. you're going to get caught up. And I know my wife gets, gets mad at me for bringing up school a lot. So she kind of <laughs> told me to, to stop. But <laughs> I will say I, I gave a study guide for a test, and my first hour, I said, I'll take any questions you have, just left and right. I'm like, oh, this is great. Second hour, what questions do you guys have? 
like. <laughs> Seriously, anything you want to go over. Frankenstein, kind of a hard book. Nothing. And then I graded them today and they were terrible. So <laughs> it's, it's just, I would ra please ask if you need help. How can, if you don't ever, if you're reading something in scripture and it's, it's confusing and you're lost, and it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to, to go to somebody. It's okay to, um, it's not an admission of weakness. I think it's a better symbol of your strength, right? You desire to be better, to learn, so that you can use it and apply it. And I wish more people would do that, right? I think we sometimes are, there's a fear. I know my students are afraid to, oh, I don't want to bring that up. But they should. Um, but they say to him, he, they get it. And then in 13, right, this is what I was, was that I was referencing before, and Tom just commented on this. Then he left the crowds back in his 1336 and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares in the field, right? Make it make sense. Give us the, okay, would you guys agree that understanding leads to more understanding? Yes. Hopefully you can understand what I'm trying to get you to understand. <laughs> that if you can understand an aspect of scripture here, then there's a pretty good chance that it's going to enable you to understand something else over here because a lot of things are interconnected. We hear all the time about how the Bible as a whole, right, we need to understand all of it. I'm going to get to that. But understanding one concept here, and I think when he describes the parable of the terrors, right, it makes the understanding of so many other things that are related more accessible too. And I think that's a good, a good comparison to us, too, right? We learn in layers. You get a little bit at a time. And Dave, you asked the question the other day. You said, are you a little bit more rooted or a little bit more knowledgeable this year than you were last year? Are we putting that time in? Are we, are we adding to our understanding? You read something a couple of times, and then something I never noticed that before. Um, I think this is the, I don't know, maybe 45th time I've read Frankenstein. And there's still, like, and the students were like, how many times have you read this? And I'm like, I don't know if you'd believe me if I told you, but a lot. But like, if you read the Bible that many times too, right? Which I should. Um, that's a good thing. It's, it's layers over time. Sorry. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And Jesus said to them, and I highlighted this for you, therefore every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven, pregnant pause, we'll wait for it, is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Okay. What is, how does he commend the disciples here? What does he call them? Did you notice that? What does he say? Or what is he, what word is he using to describe them? Teacher. Describe. Yeah. Do you guys remember Ezra from the Old Testament? When's the last time you, you dove into Ezra at first, right? Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to talk about Ezra briefly. So Ezra was a scribe, mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about, so a teacher, right? Uh, teacher of the law. There's a couple of verses that describe him as being very, very dedicated to his study and his craft. He knew it very well. He knew the law exceptionally well. And so when Jesus says here, therefore every scribe, who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven. So let's take that. So they're called scribes instructed under the kingdom of heaven. They're becoming more learned, so now that they're going to be more able or equipped to teach. Right? Did you understand these things? Yes. And now, go ahead, Mark. I just want to say, in my um, Bible, yeah. it says... He calls them not scribes, he calls them teachers of the law. Of the law. So they're already teachers of God's word, so they're very well versed. Well in versed, the law. right? And that's important. If you're going to teach anybody anything, you need to have been taught yourself. There needs to be that knowledge in place. So well, teachers among the Jews, right? The scribes. The, the scribes of the Old Testament yeah. typically copied. Yeah. Copied. They right. are the ones who copied uh, the, the, the Old Testament. Should be a long it. process, right? And yeah. Even when they would write the name Yahweh, mm -hmm. they would they were all in a room together, copying, yeah. rewriting. When they would come to the word Yahweh, they would bow their heads and only one person could write that name. Down. Solemn, right? So Very. they knew the law because they copied it over and over and over. <clears throat> yeah. Just one thing too, that, that, that's what Randy's saying as well, is that if they even made one mistake, one mistake. they literally ripped it up and started it over. 
so the seriousness mm -hmm. that we went into that and just yeah. the painstaking patience. Painstaking is a good word, yeah. Yeah, yeah the way no, it didn't come around until 1950. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Printing press, oh, thank goodness. Sure the printing press. Um, so isn't, isn't, wouldn't a gospel preacher then be a scribe too? Couldn't you, couldn't you use that same line of thought, right? I think be, go ahead, scribe John. literally means a writer of something, mm -hmm. something that writes it down. But right. the men who were the writers were also the ones that the people came to. Yeah. They came to the for scribe right? for interpretation, for, for learning the law. So it's not just that they, they wrote, sure. but they were deemed as uh, the, the teachers. Of the, the knowledgeable authority or the, right, the you go to that person, yes. right? Um, so if you're going to instruct other people, right, more education examples. Sorry. <laughs> um, if I was allowed, I always, I always joke with my students too. I said, if my degree, it's not on the wall at my school. If it was on the wall, would you be any more likely to listen to me? Would that authenticate me or give me more ethos or credibility if my diploma was hanging behind me? And a lot of kids are kind of like, no, I don't think so. I'm like, what if I was dressed in a velvet jumpsuit and not a shirt and tie or a sweater vest? Would that would my ethos suffer? Would you be like, wow, why is he dressed like that, right? And so I get interesting responses, but if I didn't know anything about syntax or grammar or punctuation, if I couldn't write my way out of a burlap sack, <laughs> how am I going to be able to help them prep for the ACT, SAT, whatever it might be, or just improve their writing, right? If I don't have that knowledge base myself, right, then I'm gonna be a fraud up there and eventually they'll find me out, right? One of my colleagues used to joke, when I first, Mr. Jackson, when I first started teaching, he was like, I was afraid they, was gonna, they were going to find out I was a fraud. And I, he said that to me, and then I thought, yeah, that, is, that would be pretty bad. So it always made me feel like you've got to make sure you know your stuff. Right? And isn't it the same for us, too? I think sometimes we're afraid to maybe to teach somebody, or we don't think we know enough to teach somebody. But isn't that a good excuse to dive into the word more and become better equipped? Patrick, Mark Twain used to say, he never let his education get in the way of his learning. Absolutely. So you made a good point there. Yeah. First Timothy 4.16, this is, goes to exactly what you're saying. So what Paul was writing to Timothy, he says, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Yeah. And he says, persevere in these things, for as you do so, they will ensure salvation <coughs> not just for yourself, but those who hear you. Those who hear you. So that's exactly yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, thank you. You can, be a, you can be a tremendously talented speaker, orator, whatever word you want to use for it. You could be um, super captivating, a great motivator, but when it comes to spiritual things, right, if, if you're up there speaking or presenting, if it's not rooted in what it's supposed to be, right, rooted in the scriptures, if it's not part of that bigger plan, right, you can blow a lot of hot air. And it's like, I, I could do the same thing for my students, right? If I didn't really know my stuff and I could be telling jokes and be very witty and whatever, but if my content is lacking, what am I really teaching them? How about Ezra, though? Um, if you have your Bibles, you can turn over to Ezra chapter 7. I have it up on the screen, too, if, you, if that's easier for you. So the reference here, right, when he's addressing the disciples and he's talking about their understanding and then what this means like moving forward. Um, I found, I hadn't really read a lot I, about Ezra in the, in the recent past, so I, I went back and I read a little bit of this and I just was amazed kind of by um, just the commitment and the, the heart condition that he had in wanting to, in, in being knowledgeable in this area. So it says, this Ezra went up from Babylon and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which we were just talking about that, which the Lord God of Israel had given, and the king granted him all he requested, because the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. And then if you move a couple verses down, I think it's 10, for Ezra had his heart, had set his heart, excuse me, to study the law of the Lord and to practice it. Right? Practice what you preach. And to teach his statutes, the Lord's, and ordinances in Israel. Right? The commitment to study it, to know it, to put it into practice, and then to share it with those it needed to be shared with. 
There's a lot of power in teaching. There's a lot of responsibility in teaching, too. And even more so to teach truth. <clears throat> Have you understood all these things, they said to him? Yes. And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household. Now that last part. Who brings out of his treasure things new and old. I want to ask you tonight, can things be new and old simultaneously? Are those things mutually exclusive? Can something be both old and new at the same time? Yeah? Anybody have an example? Um, I don't, but I got a thought. <laughs> All right, I'll take a thought. Right. Sure. I know that was a leading question. It was. Um, so what jumps out to me is you just were talking about reading. So I never read Frankenstein. I didn't get that class. I can get you up to speed. I watched the movie. I watched the movie <laughs> with uh, what's the Jewish guy, Mel Brooks. Oh. That was a good one. That's a different. Okay. But I only That's watched it once. Yeah. Anyways, uh, but I've um, but reading the Bible because I don't really read many books, but the Bible is the most book time I got. Uh, and I think we can all agree that reading these verses over the years, you see them completely different. And I think some of that's from the wisdom that's coming from it, the Holy Spirit, you know, like I, I don't understand it all. But I do know that my mindset's changed so much in 10 years, 20 years. So looking at these verses. And I've seen it. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I, I mean that as a compliment. I, well, mean, I, I mean it as a compliment. Thanks. Uh, you, you've been straight as an arrow since I met you, though. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> I'm, like, I'm trying. But what I'm saying is, uh, real quick, with with uh, mine says teacher of the law. It notes, it footnotes the word scribes. I'd like to know what the original uh, translation is, kind of, because this is down to the nitty gritty. But I would see anybody who know who can understand these these parables now retains the information to be able to share some of this. So automatically, by answering yes, that's when he explained this. So I, yeah. anyways, I think of a of a of even a father of a household. It's interesting he used household or a mother or a teacher here, but we all have the ability to share the things that are written down that we were taught, but as we grow, the things that we're learning that engage, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. what our parents taught us, they didn't know their whole life. Sure. No, that's a good good point. Tom, thank you. I want to, can things be old and new at the same time? Scriptures yeah. is uh, Scriptures. very old, mm. very stable, and the first time you come upon it, yeah, it's new to you. Yeah. But it's, it's old, it's, it's true. Old, the though, truth right? doesn't change. Right. Yeah. yeah. Dad, I was going to ask you, do you recognize this club? It looks familiar. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a golf club that looks like it's been through a lot. This is a club that's currently in my bag. Just sandwich? This is a pitching wedge. Okay. It is a, an old Ben Hogan equalizer. It's an old club. It was my grandfather's club, and he gave it to me. And I remember when I, when I bought my first set of clubs, um, I couldn't get rid of this. And I, I took the new pitching wedge and I put it to the side and I kept grandpa's. And this pitching wedge, um, it's weathered, it's battered, it's older technology, but it's still solid. Um, I'm comfortable with it. It's been reshafted a few times. I won't tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but I have put a new grip on it, right? So it, it's the perfect combination, and it's sentimental. I'm attached to it. It was my grandpa's club, and I, I just can't leave it alone. But it's, it's comfortable, it's familiar, and it works for me. And it looks real weird in the bag next to these you know, other new clubs, but I, don't, I, don't, I can't see myself putting it to the side. You know, I think a lot in terms of sports because that's how I grew up, and I love making analogies, and I love using storytelling because that works for me. But I think of basketball, and, and I grew up in a time where there was a three-point line in basketball. That wasn't always a thing. Right? In fact, it wasn't a thing for a long time, decades. And it, it did change the game to a degree. And now everybody just wants to shoot threes. So it's, it's different. Now you have analytics, you have better equipment, you have better nutrition. There's all these new things. And there's some good there, but the fundamentals, the old stuff, there's nothing better than boxing someone out. Right? And if you don't know what that, know what that means, I'll tell you about that later. I don't want to take the time. But a good box out, your coach is going to pat you on the back for that. Fundamentally sound. That will never change or setting a really hard screen on somebody, right? If you don't know what that means, I'll tell you later, too. <laughs> but these old school fundamental things are just pivotal aspects of it. That's not gonna change. But when you combine it all together, there's room for both. How about conversion? That's not a new concept, right? That's been around for a while. 
guys remember when Jerry. when Jerry was baptized? That was cool. I was looking for a picture of my dad, but I couldn't find it. But uh, yeah, right? The, everything leading up to that point, right? And then it becomes something new. Or what about a wedding? You ever thought about a wedding as being like old and new at the same time? Like an institution that's been around for so long, when you think about Adam and Eve, and you think about the, the specialness of that, like when two become one and something is new, right? a new beginning. You're gonna get in trouble there when you get home, Ben. Oh, this is making up for it. At least it's a good picture, right? <laughs> How about the birth of a child? I hope I can put this one up and not get, not get sad. Sure miss those uh, those grandmothers of mine. There's a little picture. That's uh, Alessandra when she was born, right? The birth of a child, right? Again, go back to the garden. You've got Adam and Eve. You got Seth, and Cain, and Abel, right? It's not new, but every time there's a newness aspect of it, right? A child is born, a new life begins. <laughs> what about the Old Testament and the New Testament, though? Right? When we're talking about the end of this parable here, right? The household or the head of the household, right? Out of his treasures, new and old. So I looked into this a lot, and I'm, I'm really curious to see if, if what you guys have encountered with this, but the head of the household, right? When you think about the treasure, right? Or what has been accumulated over time. Maybe not even just material things, maybe in terms of experiences, in terms of knowledge. When you take old experiences that you've had and you combine them with new observations, what do you get? I don't really have an answer in mind necessarily, but what do you get when you take the old experiences that you have lived through and combine them with new perspective or new observations? Huh? Gives you a basis for making a decision in, in the moment. Okay. You can't, it's not just, yeah. now you've got some experience behind you. Yeah. You've made some good and bad decisions before in similar situations. So now you have an idea of what to do correctly now, like how to deal with temptation. I kind of think of, uh, you kind of describe wisdom, I feel like. It sounds kind of like wisdom. It sounds really good. Tony? All of it together can be a really good thing, right? Um, there were a couple of verses that, that popped up, and this was, this was something that I saw in Song of Solomon, and it was talking about, um, I didn't have a lot of time at the end here, but talking about the idea of these choice fruits, both new and old. So kind of like the, what I've had for a while and saved up, but also what I've just gathered, and that all of it together, right? is a good thing. When you think of the New Testament and the Old Testament, isn't understanding the old crucial to truly understanding the new? Yeah. Right? To seeing the prophecy fulfilled, to seeing all of the things that pointed to Christ's coming. Um, I know we did a series a couple of years ago, and it, was, it went extensively through the sacrificial system. And I remember many Wednesday nights watching, and it, at times it was a little slow, but just the, how those sacrifices were performed, right? The, you had the guilt offering, or the sin offering, and just the, the meticulous nature of those things that were always just kind of a temporary, until the next year type of fix, but it was all pointing to a better sacrifice, right? A pure sacrifice that was coming, a new covenant that was coming. Right. Here's a couple of, uh, I looked at um, a couple things in, in terms of like, um, kind of like ancient scholars, newer scholars, and I, I saw these, these two quotes, and I thought this was interestingly put. Things new and old, the new, the evangelical words of the apostles, and the old, the precepts of the law and the prophets. And I think a full understanding, we take the Bible as a whole, right? It's either all of it, as you like to say, Dave, or, or none of it, right? And to understand it all, you really need, you need to take all of it in. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So where do we study? Where do we start? 
The easy answer is you study all of it. At the beginning, you can, yeah. Um, well, the full picture, go ahead, Randy. I, Paul wrote to the Romans that the old law was written that we might have patience yeah. and comfort and hope. And then he wrote to the Galatians in Galatians 3 that the old law was our tutor yes. that leads us to Christ. Leads us, yep. So it's both. It's both. That's, I think, the point of the householder being in control of the house and the goods and you bring out the old jacket when it's appropriate, yep. you put on the new jacket it's when it's it. appropriate, but we have to take both. Right. And we can't, uh, we can't leave one out and expect the other to give us the, tr the whole knowledge that we need right. in order to understand the scriptures as a whole. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I yeah. agree with Randy. Yeah. But, you know, whenever I'm yeah, you know, counseling somebody, you know, they ask a question, where do I start? Where do I start, yeah. Everybody always was starting at the beginning of the book, mm -hmm. right? But I thought, no, you start in the New Testament, all right? Start in the New Testament if you want to throw in Proverbs, if you want to, or, you know. And then start, to, start to read through, understand. Even in uh, 2 John in verse 9, it says, Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teachings of Christ does not have God. And so and it goes on and it further expounds upon that. But the point is, mm -hmm. is that we live under the new covenant of Christ, right? And right. so eventually, once you understand the, the covenant in which you are, are beholden to, mm -hmm. then you go back and you start to fill in Absolutely. all of the back history. Yeah, and the, and the principles and, and, and teachings there are sound in, in, in terms of concept, right? It's, it's a foundation for what would be coming later and would be better, right? But to understand all of it, you need, you need to read all of it, and you can see how beautifully it works together. I think Matthew talks in that verse yes. 52 that yep. it's a treasure. treasure. Both old and new yes. is the treasure. Yep. Yeah. Wonderful treasure. I was just going to point out, fundamentally, without the Old Testament, the New Testament right. is, is feel free to say, just, it's just a story. And maybe mm -hmm. a good point to, yeah, the curtain did tear, but you'd still be left wondering, well, what's going, what's the deal here? But all this is prophecy. Like, without that Old felt. Testament setting this up, it is, uh, what, what would be the point of it? What, yeah. what would be the validation of it? Right. Yeah, thank, yeah good point. Thank you. I did it. I got to my last slide. Yeah. Tony. <laughs> Go ahead. Last word. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a great example. And what I think of right away when you say that is when we're getting the description of baptism and then the reference to Noah's Ark. Right, saved by water, and just the—I I feel like the concept of baptism in the New Testament is so clear, and yet you have arguments with people that can't see it. Yeah. Um, you can have the last word. <laughs> okay, I saw Mark okay. put her hand up. I had a lot of words. I had okay. hand up several times. But then I'm sorry. I—I <laughs> I got. So we missed, sorry if I missed you there. One thing I, apologize. I will say is that you mentioned something about what Dave said on Sunday about uh, mm -hmm. if you look back over your life over the last six months or a year, have you, did you say that part again? Do you remember what you said? Have you learned your name? Do you see, are you, are you, are you, are you do, do you have a deeper knowledge of the word today than you did six months ago, a year okay. ago? Yeah. So when you said that, I don't know if it was just me seeing this wrong. But I'm pretty sure, don't, don't say nothing because it's not here. I'm pretty sure, I, went up, I was up front and I looked over, I can see Keeson looking, listening, and he's nodding his head, yes. <laughs> that had an effect on me. When he's listening to this and saying, yeah, I see a difference in myself, I'm going deeper. That says something to him. The way he's looking at it and the way I should be looking at it, I think it's a message to an inspiration and a message to us all. Can I tell him you said that? Yeah, you can. <laughs> Okay, we are at that point. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this in prayer. Thank you again for being here tonight. Thank you, Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to have class and just to pause and, and take a break from the other concerns. There's so many things that bog us down and we, we, uh, we sometimes lose. Sometimes our priorities, we struggle to keep them in order. But, but being here tonight, uh, we're thankful for everyone that made that a priority. And uh, we pray that we'll have a desire to, to continue to grow together. We're thankful for the like-mindedness here. Uh, at Lincoln Park, and it's encouraging to, to see one another. 
and to know that we're all striving for the, for the same things. And we ask that you will uh, keep, us, keep us hungry for the word, is our prayer tonight, and that we will seek to, to deeper our knowledge base. Uh, and we know that if we do that, if we're willing to do that, to put the work in, we will, we will be blessed as a result. And hopefully those around us will be as well. We'll be able to help them in a, in a more profound way. We ask for forgiveness. We fall short. We acknowledge that we do. We hope that we will learn from it, that we will seek to be better, um, and that ultimately we will uh, seek to share Christ with someone this week, that we'll look for those opportunities. And we ask that you will be with us until we can meet again, and we look forward to that this coming Sunday. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thank you.